engagement and our civic scholars class of 2021. I want to welcome all of you to tonight's program to hear about the learning and impact um, of our civic scholars from their civic summer, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute. Um, so for those of you who aren't as familiar with the Gephardt Institute, our mission is to foster a culture of civic engagement throughout Washington University in St. Louis. And one of our goals to achieve this includes educating students for lifelong engaged citizenship. Civic Scholars is just that. Um, it's an opportunity for students to learn and deepen their civic agency to advance the collective good. I get the privilege of working with this amazing cohort of students and an equally amazing team. Um, I want to give a shout out at this time to uh, our coordinator for civic engagement, Genesis Steele, who is helping to control all of this technology um, and can be your source of help should you need anything during this event. I also want to recognize and thank um, my co-instructor for the Civic Scholars during the first year, Austin Sandoval Sweeney, who uh, is joining us all the way from Austin, Texas. Um, and you'll hear, you'll get to hear a little bit more about Austin uh, in the second half of the program. This is our ninth cohort of Civic Scholars, and uh, Genesis will be dropping in a bio sheet uh, into the chat so you can learn a little bit more about each of them. The Civic Summer is an integral part of their Civic Scholar experience. It's during this time that our scholars have the opportunity to work in partnership with community organizations, develop self-directed projects, and continue their learning by applying and grappling with the concepts that we've discussed throughout their time in the program. As you can imagine, preparations for the Civic Summer was in many ways unlike anything that we've experienced in years past. That said, it was very similar in many years past and that our civic scholars have always been ready to pivot and adjust their plans to meet the civic moment. While I fully expected to see lots of photos of Zoom meetings, uh, you, like I, will be pleasantly surprised to see very few of those in the presentations this evening. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information about the format this evening, Pecha Kucha, maybe some of you might be wondering, what's this strange, like, why are we calling it a Pecha Kucha presentation? Um, so Pecha Kucha is actually a Japanese term for the sound of conversation or chit chat. Um, so it's a presentation style in which a number of slides are shown for about 20 seconds each. And as the name suggests, it's a conversation starter. Um, no way can five minutes of a presentation can can it fully encapsulate the, the richness of a civic summer. Um, but our scholars have worked to pinpoint one or two items that were really pivotal to their summer to share with you this evening as, again, a conversation starter. And so we hope that you, you reach out to them to learn more about the, the breadth and depth of what they've accomplished. We'll start with half of our scholars, and then we'll have a brief intermission and stretch break. Um, and if you have questions or would like to send any words of affirmations, we invite you to use the chat to send direct messages to our scholars or to everyone. Um, as you may well see very quickly, um, our scholars are very active in the chat. Um, and so we hope that you will keep up um, and engage in the conversation with them. So before we get started, uh, while we'll share some more formal gratitudes to a number of donors and supporters uh, after the intermission, I just want to say uh, briefly an informal thank you now. Um, the Civic Summer experience in this program wouldn't be what it is without the generosity in all capacities of our donors, our national council members, our community partners, our families, um, our campus partners, all of you who are here this evening to support our students. And so I just want to share my deepest gratitude, especially in a time that we are experiencing right now, um, to each and every one of you, because community is so important. And I think we've seen the importance of that um, through the work that our scholars have done and the support that um, has been required through this period to uplift one another. So with that, um, we're gonna go right into the, the presentations. Um, and so we've never done it in this way. So I ask for grace and forgiveness now for any technical difficulties that we will likely encounter. So give me just a minute to switch for you all. Um, and so I'm gonna invite, uh, 
hold on. I'm going to invite Jessica, who will be our first person. <laughs> All right. It's always so jarring to see your face just blown up. <laughs> All right. Wait, hold on. <laughs> okay. 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 Hey, everyone. My name is Jessica, and I use she, her pronouns. My discussion today will be centered on making the connections between the abolitionist framework and addressing anti Blackness within the Asian community. Before I start on that, I wanna talk a little bit about why I chose this topic for my summer. I applied to civic scholars with the project idea of how to create lab settings that are more conducive for the success for historically oppressed communities. However, due to the pandemic, limited capacity from my community partner and going through everything that has happened with the movement for black lives, I didn't feel it was right for me to work on such an institutional project anymore. So that is the reason why I pivoted my summer. But to dive right back into the topic at hand, I wanted to start with this. On January 9th, 1966, an article titled, Success Story, Japanese American Style, written by a white man was published in the New York Times. In the closing paragraph, he wrote, placed at the bottom of this country's scale, he, the black American, finds it difficult to savage his ego by measuring his worth in another currency. The Japanese, on the contrary, who climb over the highest barriers our racists were able to fashion in part because of their meaningful links with an alien culture. While relatively unknown nowadays, this was a news piece that first publicized and popularized the model minority myth. The narrative which insinuates that even though Asians are discriminated against, they can still succeed. So why can other people of color and in particular the black community Campaigns aimed at dismantling the model minority myth, such as the Not Your Model Minority campaign, often fail to acknowledge that this myth was primarily created to pit the Asian and Black community against each other during the rise of the 60s Black power movement in the United States. That this myth was intended to sow anti-Blackness within the Asian community. This point was what I addressed in one of the 12 workshops aimed at dismantling Asian anti-Blackness that I co-created and co-facilitated over the summer with Asian and Pacific Islanders Demanding Justice, which is a group for API folks to organize around political and social issues at WashU. We started this series of workshops after George Floyd was killed on May 25th, 2020 by four cops, one of them who is Asian, because we recognized that the usually stagnant apolitical Asian community became ready to confront the anti-Blackness that had permeated throughout their life. Most of the people who attend the workshops all had one question. My family is racist. How do I talk about anti-Blackness with my family? Or I grew up with racist parents. How do I tell them that what they are saying is harmful? And while we ended up holding workshops to address that, I realized that I myself still do not have the answer. And I think that is one of the biggest takeaways from the summer, that we are continuously growing and learning that we do not have to have all the answers and that as organizers, we aren't supposed to have all the answers because if we did, then we wouldn't need to organize anymore. Furthermore, I also realize that this learning and growing doesn't have to happen by myself. I would even say perhaps the only way to learn about community issues is to do so while in community with others because otherwise we would be succumbing to the same pattern of isolation, avoidance and silence that brought us here in the first place. And you know what? That is radical because the same system that expects us to learn through only reading, lectures and tests is the same system that upholds white supremacy. What I am saying is also not new. This has long been championed by abolitionist educators such as Bettina Love, Goldie Muhammad and Dana Simmons who spoke at a virtual event held by Haymarket Books about abolitionist teaching. During the event, someone asked the question, do we need to create our own schools? And all three of these educators said, yes. While this may sound intimidating, I think this process deeply connects back to the lessons I learned while teaching about addressing Asian anti-Blackness. And that is the idea that we cannot rely on or wait for people to tell us the solutions that we need to create it ourselves. 
And this work is supposed to be hard because we are creating a future that has not yet existed before. With that, I'll close with a reminder that I also echoed in one of the workshops. While I talked about holding conversations being a part of addressing anti-Blackness within the Asian community, it is not enough to dismantle white supremacy. And while it may seem difficult to think beyond that, we also need to remember that there are already people who are doing this work. All we have to do is join them. Um, okay. Great job, Jessica, also. Sorry, this is <laughs> weird, like not hearing people applaud. Um, but yes, I'll get started. So coming into the Civic Scholars Program, I knew I wanted to impact the intersection of two things, um, immigrants and the arts. So when I describe myself, I say I'm a designer, a visual artist, a businesswoman, a fitness instructor, an activist, a makeup enthusiast, among many other things. And as you can see, I guess at the intersection of some pretty unique identities and I've always had a passion for uplifting others of many backgrounds, especially those following unconventional paths. Um, as a first generation Muslim Egyptian American, um, I was raised in a strong Muslim community on the south side of Milwaukee, full of immigrants and refugee background individuals who were or who were raising the world's next doctors, engineers and lawyers. However, an often neglected side of my community as a result of the intense focus on traditional forms of success in the United States um, were the arts. Um, an integral piece of the complex cultures of the Middle East that made up my community um, were the arts and the arts tied individuals in my community back to their roots and to the craft of their homeland. The value that the arts hold in immigrant communities in the United States, however, somehow diminishes from this like incredible cornerstone that re they represent in the home countries of these communities, um, be it because of the lack of platforms for immigrant artists or the low amount of exposure that these artists get or the fear of putting yourself out there without even knowing when to start and then failing. And this is the exact gap that some pop soup seeks to fill. So some pop soup coming from the Arabic word souk or market is my Milwaukee founded pop-up farmers art market collective where artists, creators, craftsmen and entrepreneurs of immigrants and refugee background can sell and promote their work. Members of the collective range from hobbyists to full blown small business owners and some pop souk is here to uplift and empower them through free creative and marketing consulting, professional branding services, some pop soup seeks to provide these creators with the resources they had been missing, the support they needed to take the first step and the platform for product promotion and sale that didn't exist for them, all while fostering a blossoming community and offering good vibes, just like all around. Um, empowerment comes in many forms, whether it's teaching someone a skill they didn't have, offering your services to another to help uplift them, creating a resource or a space for someone to be appreciated, recognized and seen, or putting your dollars to something that maybe hasn't gotten the attention and support it deserves. Whatever form empowerment takes for you, some pop soup is here for it empowering and uplifting the creatives that you don't normally see on your Instagram feed. That's most likely currently overflowing with like TikToks and memes and influencers. So I spent my summer really diving into these um, relationships with my Sun Pop creatives, learning a lot about web design, like a lot, um, working very long hours, setting up posts on Instagram and Facebook, um, editing photos, designing logos, and coming up with sustainable business models for my creatives, marketing some pop soup to other small businesses, building collaborations, and I even tried to start a TikTok, and I absolutely loved every single minute of it. I worked with many different types of creatives, ranging from people who were some of my closest friends to immigrant families who spoke little to no English, and my position therefore changed with every interaction I had, and I learned to navigate everything from working with family members, which was very interesting, to working with people I've never met before due to COVID. Um, meeting everyone's desires and specific situations was challenging. However, I'm so grateful to have entered these spaces. And at the beginning, it was pretty emotionally taxing on me because some pop suit was my entire life and my baby, but learning to produce content in a way that serves and caters to the population I was willing to empower allowed me to instead refocus and realize that the aesthetics mattered less than the connections and work I was doing. In many ways, some pop soup was a challenge into the way that I even perceived systems of inequity and highlighted many more forms of inequity that I didn't even know about. Um, the culture of influencers and the toxicity of social media was a challenge for me considering that my entire project was focused on growing and marketing on social media. 
And I'm now proud to say that Sun Pop Soup broke 1,700 followers in its mere three months inception. However, getting there as a platform looking to highlight those voices that haven't been highlighted before by someone, aka me, who's not an influencer and not just a white person promoting products on Instagram was definitely difficult. However, these power imbalances are exactly why we need Sunpop Souk in the first place. And this is exactly why I've continued to work on growing Sunpop Souk and building it out while I've also been a student here this semester, despite the crazy challenge of switching from doing it as a full-time job to being a side project. Um, though this has been crazy for me, this work gives me so much joy and I'm really grateful to say that I found what I want to do for the rest of my life, empower others through the arts and business. I could not be more excited to see where Sun Pop Suit and this passion both grow and take me in the future. Right now, everything is uncertain and the future is a big question mark for everyone in the world. What I do know though, is that wherever I end up, Sun Pop Suit will come with me, be it as the next big Instagram business blowing up your feed or simply as the passion for empowering others that drives me every day. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Josie and I use she, her pronouns. So these are some of the members of the Emergency Support Team or EST, which is the EMS squad I volunteered on while I've been a student at WashU. The group is completely comprised of undergrad volunteers and it provides free emergency medical care to anyone on the Danforth campus. I'd never heard of anything like this before I came to college, but this operational model is somewhat common. There are over 300 squads on campuses around the country registered with the National Collegiate EMS Foundation. And what I find exciting about these collegiate squads and EST in particular is the demographic of the EMTs who comprise them. The rapid turnover and enthusiasm of the volunteers makes it easier to seriously consider questions like what makes good patient care or how can we really best serve our community than it might be with a squad of career paramedics. I spent my civic summer trying to address these questions from the perspective of trauma-informed healthcare. As I began researching in May, I found quickly that although there was a lot of research out there about trauma-informed healthcare generally, there was little to nothing specific to EMS or first responders. I worked to develop trainings and policies for EST that addressed the substance abuse and mental health services six trauma-informed principles. While keeping in mind the specific ways in which EMS procedures differ from primary care or emergency room ones, I considered how as first responders we can prevent re-traumatization from past experiences and decrease the likelihood of new trauma formation on calls, and how we can practice equitable healthcare in a national EMS framework that is so white-centric and heteronormative. In doing this work, it became clear how important it was to consider the intersection of systemic change and individual action in creating a trauma-informed organization. It is vital to have both trauma-informed systems and leadership structures and individual providers who are committed to utilizing them. One alone isn't enough. Considering the long-term impact I hoped my project would have, most of my work, work focused on changing systems on EST. This took form in a variety of projects I got to work on with other team members from protocol and training reviews to the creation of a patient feedback form. Perhaps the most important of the projects though was the work I engaged with around finding an alternative to police presence on EST. As calls for police abolition nationally and on campus became more public this summer following the murder of George Floyd, we began to discuss how we could address the way WUPD officers on EST calls affect patient access to care. This problem is directly related to a trauma-informed framework and that mandatory police presence on calls makes it impossible to create a safe space for patients who carry trauma related to policing, no matter how many internal EST policies are in place. And this disproportionately burdens BIPOC and queer patients serving as an increased barrier to care for communities continually ignored by our healthcare system. I was really inspired by some of the organizations around the country who are already doing this work, such as CAHOOTS or Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets, which is an organization based in Oregon that pairs crisis workers and medics in a first responder model that is dispatched for medical and mental health emergencies as a police alternative. While EST still has a long way to go, we were able to push the police department to create a written policy detailing officer conduct on EST calls. 
No such documentation existed prior to this summer, which meant there was very little standardization or accountability, and we were unable to let the campus community know what to expect from officers on EST calls. Looking ahead, it's been really exciting to work with some students involved in the new campus public safety committee to advocate for the introduction of social workers in emergency settings on campus. While this work is still in its early stages, it's the first step towards an operational model that more closely resembles CAHOOTS. This aspect of my summer has shifted my perspective on best practices with healthcare reform more broadly. It's encouraged me to think more about an integrative healthcare approach, where a patient's physical and mental health are considered and treated in the context of their life beyond their immediate symptoms. Relating this to my work with EMS, I've been thinking about how instead of increasing the responsibility of already demanding healthcare jobs, it might be more effective to increase access to resources and then better define those jobs. For example, instead of asking medical providers who also serve as social workers, maybe we should be creating more space for social workers in healthcare environments. That's not to say that it's not important EMTs are familiar with trauma-informed framework and can use inclusive language and practices. It's more just to point out how I've learned that this kind of work can only be so effective without addressing the bigger systems we're practicing in. Trainings and protocol reviews are an important step towards equitable healthcare, but they need to be one of many to be impactful. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Eliza Caperton. I use she, her pronouns. And um, yeah, something else about me. I'm from Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, and I am studying studio art and American culture studies. Uh, for my civic summer, I did a self-directed research project on the role of art in the pandemic. Um, I think I realized that this made me more specifically was looking at the role of an artist in the pandemic. Uh, but what all of this meant was me learning through interviews, reading, listening, making mistakes, etc. The ways in which I can use my passion and skills as an artist to make an impact. What I did can be broken down to three different approaches to art. The first art as something that carries meaning, the second art as a commodity, and the third art as a form of healing. For the first approach, art as something that carries meaning, I was initially thinking of making art to document this moment. However, shortly after deciding that, there was the murder of George Floyd and the rise in Black Lives Matter activism. I knew I could not ignore what was happening, but as a white person, I also knew it was not my voice that needed to be heard. So I took a step back and focused on self-educating on racism, part of which involved looking specifically at how systemic racism affects where I'm from, rural West Virginia, and the Appalachian region more broadly. Uh, as I was doing this, I was asked about making art to educate a white audience on racism. And at first, admittedly, I was hesitant thinking about famous examples of artists doing this and getting it wrong. But I decided to give it a try, seeing it as a learning opportunity. So I spent a lot of time throughout the summer making things, uh, but ultimately found everything I made to in some way be problematic. However, in taking time to reflect on why and do further research, I found there was a lot to learn within these missteps. I'll give an example. I used this style of colorful house drawing seen here to try to make an illustration about the use of roads in redlining neighborhoods. So this drawing that we'll show shortly, I find problematic for a variety of reasons. One of the main ones being that the cheerfulness in the style of this drawing does not match the seriousness of the subject. When making visual art to educate, the information being used becomes aestheticized, meaning that it's translated into a cohesive and compelling visual language. It's important that the visual language matches the tone and seriousness of the subject, making a subject as destructive as redlining look playful look playful is in my opinion a form of whitewashing meaning that the information is made more palatable to a white audience as it ignores the seriousness of the reality of the subject so this is just one example of the many things i tried throughout the summer ultimately though i shifted my um, educational efforts to just having direct conversations with white people in my life and sharing things we were all learning at the end of the summer, I compiled all of this research, reflections, and images into a sort of personal archive uh, that I believe could be shared in a conversational setting. Uh, I just want to drive home, though, that the idea of white artists making work about racism is an incredibly complicated topic. A lot of it depends on the situation and individual's interpretations. The only way I feel to conclude this is with further questions, such as, what does it mean to make images about a history that isn't your own? Um, and then another question that kind of led me to the second part of my project is, 
Are there ways other than communicating information that art can contribute to change? So part two, art as a commodity. I conducted two fundraisers where I sold my art. The first one was in partnership with Wash Youth Student Environmental Council. Um, they did a fundraiser uh, to help for efforts that are helping to fight environmental racism in St. Louis. Through doing this, I learned a lot about the logistics of fundraising, um, specifically through social media, you know, advertising my work, communicating with people. Um, and then with all of that in mind, I did a second fundraiser for the St. Louis area food bank. And I chose this organization because food banks serve a crucial role in my rural high poverty home community. And I believe this resonated with a lot of people from my home and made the fundraiser that much more successful. Uh, moving forward though, I plan to focus on some grassroots organizations. For the third approach um, within my project, Art as a Form of Healing, I was reflecting on how taking time to care for the relationships and communities in my life, as well as my own mental health, ended up being a very part, prominent part of my summer, um, with these pictures kind of referencing the amount of time spent taking walks. Uh, so I started making, with all of this in mind, uh, a hand-drawn animation. These are two stills from that, that's sort of a reflection on this experience. It's still in progress, but maybe at the intermission I could share um, a link to where I currently have. Um, moving forward, I learned a lot of things this summer that are going to serve as a foundation within my art practice. Um, and I'm already kind of doing these things today. This is an example. I've been um, making these t-shirts with prints of houses that mean something to me here in St. Louis. And then I'm donating part of the profits to Dream Builders for Equity, an organization here working with youth mentorship and vacancy and housing. Uh, overall, you know, this summer made me realize that after graduating, I want to apply to residency programs and thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Garcia and I use she, her pronouns and I'm a global health and the environment major. While recently looking back at my project planning, one of my goals immediately stood out. I had written that an outcome of my project would be for individuals to feel that all components of their identity are accepted, respected, and welcome. This resonated with me because though this goal I'd say is not one that can be quantified in a tangible manner, it encompasses the values of the three different organizations I partnered with this summer. Initially, I wanted my project to explore how health interventions can be affected when an individual's identity are regarded as a whole rather than as separate. The undocumented immigrant and LGBTQ communities were the intersection that I had hoped to work with, though ultimately this idea shifted. Fortunately, the organizations I worked with allowed me to engage with differing yet overlapping communities. This is a quote from a webinar that I attended this summer, which highlights that COVID-19 has impacted the sense of security and well-being of many. Each of the three organizations I've partnered with have been affected differently, but still sought to provide services or programs and projects surrounding the pandemic's impact on their communities, and I will briefly attempt to discuss each of them. Casa de Salud is an organization in St. Louis that provides trauma-informed healthcare to those who are under and uninsured and focuses on immigrants and refugees. My role this summer was a mental health intake specialist, which meant that I would call new clients interested in initiating services, uh, counseling services, and would also follow up with current clients about their treatment. While initially communicating with CASA, I was told that due to the pandemic, they were training new volunteers because they expected that the number of clients seeking counseling would increase. I found this to be true in multiple instances when I would follow up with client individuals who had been marked to be discharged from counseling and they would express that they instead wanted to continue with the counseling services. The other organization I worked with was WFSI. They are part of the Social Policy Institute at WashU and they seek to research how the working conditions of frontline workers affect their financial stability and also research ways that workplace innovations can improve these conditions. Their research became increasingly connected to COVID-19 due to its impact on frontline workers. Last but not least, I worked with the Association of Latinx's Motivating Action, which is based in Chicago, and whose mission is to reaffirm the culture and rights of the LGBTQ Latinx community. Alma this year was celebrating its 30th anniversary and shifted its, event, uh, its panel event to a virtual platform during the LGBTQ Pride Month this past June. The discussion of the panel revolved around the impact of the current pandemic on the queer community and also sought to connect lessons that have been learned from past events, such as the HIV slash AIDS crisis. These were the panelists, and due to the event being virtual, Alma was fortunate to be able to include individuals from many different locations, such as different states and countries. Though those were all very brief summaries, I learned through these organizations that the process and approach of the experiences and work can be just as, and sometimes more meaningful um, than the output. 
Not only did the organizations I worked with also strive to accomplish the goal I had initially set for myself, but they also highlighted other values. One is representation. Being an immigrant myself, I've, surrounded, I've been surrounded by the stigma of seeking mental health resources. And this past summer, I have learned that representation can hold value in combating the stigma. I saw this in the cases of individuals who had initially sought CASA services due to being referred by members of their own communities that they trusted. And additionally, while choosing panelists with ALMA, representation was a factor strongly considered. It was necessary for us to include a diverse group of panelists who could provide insight into varying perspectives. And also, while I was attending webinars for Whoopsie, I was continuously thrown information about policy changes and statistics, yet the most accessible moments were those presented by frontline workers themselves who voiced their concerns and needs. The statistics and information presented in the webinars were necessary, but the individuals speaking their experiences were just as impactful. The quote mentioned above is from a restaurant owner who is implementing a model emphasizing the importance of having someone in charge who can represent the workers because he believed that that's a major source of empowerment. Not only did I find the representation of identities important, but also of language. With CASA, I continually took into account the languages and tones I spoke with, and this was especially important in regard to questions on the topic of suicide, because I could not indicate the approval or disapproval of certain responses. The client said to feel free to express all of their thoughts and truths without judgment. Keeping in the theme of language, as someone who was raised speaking Spanish, but now is a lot more comfortable with English, I have the ability to choose and speak and learn, choose to speak and learn in the language that I'm secure in, while many do not. And since the barriers of language can impact accessibility to comprehensive healthcare, I found it necessary to recognize the privileges of language. Overall, the summer has solidified to me that access to resources such as mental health counseling is one manner in which the differing identities and individual holds can impact accessibility. And as someone who is interested in pursuing a career in the health field, this has also emphasized how important it is to me that someone who looks like me is also represented. Thank you. Okay, hello. My name is Jane, and I use she, her pronouns. So this image is often used to represent how it should feel to go through the design research process through research, brainstorming, testing and prototyping, it outlines a path towards clarity and focus when working with big, seemingly insurmountable problems. But is like the path here emerge. This graphic is much more representative of both my relationship with design and how the process actually plays out. As I started to explore the ways that design is often a tool of white saviorism and white supremacy, I became more and more jaded with it as an approach. It seemed to model, it seemed to follow this model of parachuting in, throwing out ideas, and not sticking around to see how they played out. But before I get into the rest of this, I want to try and define what I mean by design research. One of the biggest hints that this process was too good to be true was that I was never really able to define what it was. However, I've now landed on something pretty simple. It's just a process for problem solving. It's nothing special. It's just a set of tools for making things intentionally. Uh, it's not the only way, it's not the best way, and it's something that everyone does every day. But even with all these criticisms, I couldn't shake my fascination with design. Eventually, I realized that I wasn't so obsessed with what I'd actually seen it do, but how it made me feel, which was that I had a way forward. It gave me a set of tools and activities so that when I was faced with big problems in my life and in my community, I didn't feel quite so paralyzed. I could write design criteria to help me identify the qualities of a good idea, and I had prototyping tools for making really, tan in really intangible ideas more tangible in order to get better feedback on them. But what I didn't have was any guidance on how to build relationships in which I could actually co-create something using these tools. So with this feeling in mind, I knew I wanted to spend my summer looking at design research methodology and the ways it can be helpful and harmful in community-engaged work. In trying to do this, I spent a lot of time looking outward towards new partnerships and opportunities in my hometown of Seattle. But when COVID forced me to look even more internally, I realized that's where I should have been focusing all along. I've been talking with my younger sister, this is us at Thanksgiving last year, um, earlier in the year about an idea she and her friends in French class came up with while bonding over shared complaints about their teacher. They wanted to start a club where students could feel comfortable sharing peer to peer what was stressing them out and then talk with the school administration and teachers to make changes. We've been talking about the ways a design research approach could help them flesh out what the club would actually look like. And so a program I ended up calling For Students by Students was born. My sister helped form one team looking to make this club and we recruited another team of students interested in doing similar work and chose an overarching topic of mental health. Then we spent nine weeks going through a design research curriculum 
and in interviewing other students and teachers, uh, brainstorming and testing ideas based on their insights, the teams came up with actionable next steps for addressing mental health in their community. And honestly, at first, I was a little uneasy about spending all the time and resources that Civic gave me working with my already extremely privileged high school. But working with these students this summer really reinforced in me the importance of and potential for real impact that comes from engaging with communities that you already belong to. I also did a lot of reading this summer and interesting, interestingly found that the best articulation of why I'm so obsessed with design didn't come from a design context. The book Emergent Strategy helped explain why I felt so drawn to design. I realized it was facilitation as opposed to design itself that I appreciated so much. Um, the book has this definition of facilitation as the art of making things easy, making it easier for humans to work together and get things done. And so in the book, she acknowledges that this doesn't mean making things simple, um, but that facilitation seeks to reduce friction between people and ideas. And that's exactly what I was able to see happen this summer. One example of this reduced friction was the feedback we got on the counselor of the day table. Through our interviews, the teams learned and shared with their partner at the school that students wanted to use this resource, but because it was a mental health counselor sitting in a very busy lunchroom, students, busy lunchroom like this, um, students felt uncomfortable approaching them in such a public space. Our project was not the only way that this feedback could have been passed along, but it did help facilitate the conversation that made it easier for that information to get to the right people. And I really want to emphasize that none of what I learned this summer is new or ground, that groundbreaking and organizations like these are already doing this work and changing the field. This work also pulls on the expertise of community organizers, social workers, and so many people outside the design field with more experience with that relationship building part of the process. This project has encouraged me to really start trying to make some moves towards restructuring the organization where I first learned about design to be more equitable and ask better questions about the work we say we want to do. You can't work on reducing friction between people if they don't have a relationship to start with. And so we're trying to use the tools of design on ourselves and see what emerges from that. So there's a long way to go, but I'm still learning. Um, but I think I'm starting to become more comfortable with the ambiguity of this kind of squiggle. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brooke Bolmash and I'm studying architecture here at WashU. Um, I spent this past summer learning about vacant land in St. Louis, uh, while also interning with St. Louis Development Corporation's Green City Coalition. Uh, GCC is largely responsible for coordinating demolitions, management of city-owned vacant lots, and facilitating community access to vacant lot projects. Um, St. Louis has between 20,000 and 30,000 vacant parcels. Most of these are situated in the northern part of the city and nearly 13,000 of these are owned by the Land Reutilization Authority, the city of St. Louis's public land bank. This is a map of vacant land in North St. Louis. Rather than focus on the colorful bits representing those parcels, I want you to think about the light gray areas in and around them. These are the folks that live with vacancy on a daily basis. Vacant land is not only costly to the city to maintain, but it lowers property values around it and creates many public health and safety concerns for the neighborhood's residents. The perception of the neighborhood changes and rather than seeing it as a place where people live, lots become magnets for illegal dumping from folks outside of the community. The problem itself is a side effect of larger structural issues like disinvestment from the city in predominantly black neighborhoods. The resources dedicated to addressing vacancy are limited, limited funding, limited information, limited support. This summer, I witnessed firsthand how many barriers there are to meaningful change. Vacancy is by no means an issue limited to St. Louis. Other cities like Cleveland, Detroit, and Pittsburgh also face high vacancy. Before jumping into action, I looked into the projects these cities have taken to address vacant lots from a community level. These precedents helped inspire and guide some of the work I did this summer. My main concentration this summer focused on continuing the development of a vacant land reutilization toolkit, which was intended to be a community resource to provide information about acquiring, designing, and implementing neighborhood projects on vacant lots for neighborhood groups uh, like churches and um, 
the toolkit includes some ideas of what can be done with a small budget on a lot. It's meant to function as a workbook for community groups. Uh, these are two pages that allow for idea generation and thinking through the logistics of a lot project, particularly in terms of project team and the location of the lot. And then this chart was developed to give groups an idea of where to start in their idea generation based around level of experience, funding, site conditions, and maintenance requirements. Each of these seven categories then had a corresponding page that provided insight into the process of that particular project type, along with local project examples. After spending time looking into precedents from other cities, I wanted to emphasize that there are many possibilities for what can be done on a vacant lot. I selected a few creative ideas to jumpstart some thinking outside the box, but it's important to remember that each of these lots is different and there isn't a one size fits all solution to repurposing vacant lots. While my original plan for the summer had been to really get a sense for what vacancy means to the communities it directly impacts, the pandemic made it impossible to work directly in these communities. I would have liked to show the community the toolkit and get feedback on its utility from the groups for which it is intended, um, but the, the rollback has been delayed. Um, I had the opportunity to engage in, in conversations about the redevelopment of Peace Park in the College Hill neighborhood which actually is a very thoughtful community focused project. The meetings also organized Operation Clean Sweep, this, which this year helped repaint College Hill's famous standpipe water tower, which is an important community landmark. A landscape architect here in St. Louis is helping out with the design of Peace Park based on a series of earlier community design workshops and recent surveys. The pandemic made engagement more challenging, but Carla Brown, a resident of College Hill and Green City Coalition's community outreach and engagement coordinator, really rose to the occasion and came up with creative ways to reach residents. In this work, it's necessary for residents to have access to planning of projects to ensure that they have autonomy in their neighborhoods. They know what is best um, for them and what they actually need. This summer bolstered my belief that all communities deserve access to green space and it's vital to health, happiness, and well-being. My summer was a starting point. Vacant land reuse has a lot of potential for meaningful change. I have every intention of continuing my work in this area. The most important consideration going forward is to ensure the voices of communities grappling with vacancy on a regular basis are heard. It requires socially responsible design and creative placemaking. Thank you. Hi everyone. <clears throat> my name is Carrie. I use she, her pronouns, and I am studying American culture studies and music. So this is me at 13 years old with my first electric guitar. This picture sums up what my first several years of playing it were like, a little timid, pretty awkward, but nevertheless enthusiastic. I remember finishing homework and heading straight to my room to try cover songs by my favorite artists. So fast forward. This is me in spring of 2019 playing a music festival with guitar at full volume, now a lead singer, which would have absolutely shocked my 2012 self but it's a transformation that was made possible with my band and having a supportive creative community played such a huge role in my confidence and my self-expression. Now, my positive band experience is not one I take for granted. I defied barriers of access with musical resources and networks. I have felt safe expressing my gender and sexual identities however I choose, but everyday diverse women and non-binary folks are discouraged from taking up too much space in music as evident in this reader feedback here. But there are artists, activists, and organizations challenging exclusionary cultures every day to ensure that music, whether in the context of the industry or music programs for young people are accessible and, and inclusive. Um, and I realized that that is the work that I wanted to guide my civic summer. So that's how I arrived at Rain City Rock Camp, a nonprofit in Seattle that aims to empower female, trans, and gender expansive youth through music they have programs throughout the year, but the focal point is their summer camp, which includes two, ses two sessions of instrument lessons, activism workshops, and band practices for youth seven to 17. And in case you were wondering, yes, this was all moved to a virtual format this summer. For both sessions, I volunteered as a band coach, guiding campers through songwriting, teaching them how to use collaborative recording software. And this was my group of seven-year-olds who named, those, named themselves the Golden Flying Pugs. They rocked very hard. They were a bunch of fun. 
So this is what band practice looked like every day over Zoom. Um, campers recorded instruments at home and track by track composed an entire song over the course of the week. One of my favorite memories is a particular camper who really barely said a word the first few days of camp, sort of answered questions with a shrug or a nod, but she ended up writing and recording some incredible vocals for her band that just blew everyone away. And getting that feedback was super transformative for her. And on the slide is also a zine a different camper made about being a girl who listens to punk music. And I also did some media work while I was there that included fundraising designs, which you're seeing here. But my favorite part of the media work was camper testimonial interviews. So I would ask campers what they love about rock camp. And he replies like, I can be myself here. No one judges me. I can express myself however I want. And that told me that I was working in the right place and having the impact I set forth at the beginning. So I want to return to this theme of voice. Music has helped me find mine and I want young people interested in the arts to be able to do the same. And in addition to Marine City, I spent the summer thinking a lot about how else I can use my energy and use my voice. So in response to ongoing police murders, I, I found myself taking to the streets quite a bit, including this one in front of the McCloskey's house. I listened to Black Lives Matter organizers. I had conversations with white family members and friends about systemic racism and how we intend to engage in anti-racism work moving forward. I also invested my voice and energy in urban farming and learning about food justice with local nonprofit Urban Harvest STL. Uh, so guided by a commitment to sustainability, I applied for farm and media positions that allowed me to rapidly learn and then create informational tools for the public like this poster about the benefits of planting native species. But food access really remained at the forefront of this work um, Urban Harvest STL donates the majority of produce from their farms to food insecure residents in North St. Louis, including communities that have long been subject to discriminatory housing policies and environmental racism. So it was really meaningful to work with my hometown um, being from St. Louis. And while every component and conversation of my summer was formative and crucial in its own way, I would say that my work with Rock Camp really solidified my ongoing goals of empowering young people with music the staff there taught me what it looks like to bring young people into conversations about activism, self-expression, body positivity, using music as a conduit. So watching campers find their voices and confidence in the same way that I have was the highlight of my summer. And this semester I've started tutoring with the International Institute to further my commitment to teaching and mentoring young people. And I'm beyond excited to stay involved with Rain City and eventually seek full-time work that combines art and social change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, if you are off, uh, if you can go off mute for a moment and just give a round of applause to this first half of our students, because okay, maybe it's just good. I'm going to be the one for all of you. <laughs> um, just amazing, right? And how many how many Zoom photos did we see? Not that many, as promised. Um, so we want you to stick around. There will be, that was our first half. Um, we have eight more presentations after the intermission. We'll take a brief break, about 10 minutes, and come back at 6 p.m., um, where we will kick off with some quick remarks from Austin sandoval Sweeney, and then we'll have our collective impact team. So we have a, a team of students who worked together on a project over the summer um, to, to advance some, uh, some work related to COVID. So please join us back here in about eight minutes um, at 6 p.m. where we will get started again. Thank you. On the slides under each of the students' name, um, a named scholarship, um, and those were uh, generous donors who supported our students to be able to participate in this program, provided the stipends, um, 
for their civic summers. And so I just want to say uh, a public thanks um, to the Klein handlers, um, to the Burlines, uh, the Virgils, um, Bob Fox and Maxine Clark, uh, and the Sidons uh, and the Stearns who are contributors to the program and make this possible for our students. And many of you are here in the audience today. And so I hope that you have an opportunity to connect directly to your scholars um, to share your, your um, support and encouragement and that our scholars get the opportunity to connect to you as well. I also want to give our thanks to our fearless leader, Stephanie Kurtzman, the director of the Gephardt Institute, who is here and has been sharing lots of messages of, um, of, of being impressed. And as she said to me in a private message, astounding, no surprise, but nonetheless astounding. And I think that really describes you know, the circumstances under which our civic scholars have worked. Um, you wouldn't have even known that the pandemic was happening and yet they still were able to advance such incredible work. Um, so with that, I wanna pass to uh, my partner in crime and co-instructor during the first year, um, Austin Sandoval Sweeney to introduce the second half of presentations this evening. All right, thanks so much, Teresa. And uh, I echo uh, my thanks to uh, Stephanie, um, as well as Genesis and Teresa for giving me a chance to work with this remarkable group of scholars. And uh, after I was only able to be an instructor for one out of the two years, thanks for even having me back and inviting me tonight to see the culmination of this work over the past couple of years. Um, as Teresa mentioned, my name is Austin Sandoval Sweeney. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, worked in various roles in uh, student affairs at WashU over the past several years. And last year I had the privilege of co-instructing this awesome group of seniors. Uh, this cohort has meant a lot to me on both a personal and professional level. Uh, from day one, as I got to know them last year, they had the kindness in them to welcome me as an instructor and community member and thought partner into their cohort in a way that I never would have imagined. And I really can't fully express my gratitude and what that meant to me at the time and what that has continued to mean to me. Um, you made me a more curious and informed citizen and you piqued my interest in pursuing a career path focused on serving students more squarely at the intersection of their personal and academic lives and interests. Um, and while you started your civic scholars journey in what I think was a rather typical way, as Teresa alluded to, um, you had to change and end it in an atypical way that none of us ever would have imagined. You adapted so quickly and effectively as evident by your presentations tonight, and you did so in the midst of a global pandemic, a national reckoning on race that has left us still with so much to resolve. And you did so during an election season in which so much of what you stand and advocate for was on the ballot. And I would say perhaps even more important than that is throughout the process, I was so amazed uh, last spring and into the early parts of the summer by how much you all stuck together as a community and supported one another and reminded one another uh, to take care of yourselves throughout everything that you were navigating. Um, I can only hope I was able to give you a fraction of what I feel I have gained from my time with each of you. Um, it has truly been humbling and a joy to get to know and work with all of you. And while I'm sad I couldn't experience the final stretch of your civic time with you all. Um, the fact that my very last meeting ever with a group of students at WashU um, was, was with you all. And I will always uh, hold that with me and appreciate that. And uh, as you see, my wall here is adorned with superhero paraphernalia, but it is really you all, the seniors of this year and civic scholars who are the, are the real heroes. So I'm so proud of all of you. And uh, again, Teresa, thanks so much for giving me the chance to be a part of this community. 
Awesome. Thank you, Austin. And so with that, we are going to dive into the second half of presentations um, and start with our collective impact team. So before they get started, I just want to share a little bit about what this team is. Um, each year, uh, thanks to the generosity of the Stern family, we have been able to offer a team of students um, some additional funding to support a, a team collaborative effort. As I say to the students, um, no big hairy problems are solved individually. They are problems that need uh, solutions from many people. And so this is our way of helping to incentivize our students to work collaboratively collaboratively to address some of these challenges. And so our next group is our collective impact team for, uh, for this year. They applied to, with an additional grant proposal um, to be able to do this work collectively. Um, and so you'll see they had individual projects, but also shared projects that they did together and how it's all woven together. So I'm going to invite Keishi, Callie, and Mackenzie to be our first group of presenters. Hi everyone, um, I'm Keishi and I use she, her, hers pronouns and I am majoring in global health and minoring in uh, American culture studies. Hi everyone, my name is Callie Shu. Um, I use she, her pronouns as well and I'm majoring in international area studies. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mackenzie. I use she, her, hers pronouns and my major is philosophy, neuroscience, psychology on the cognitive neuroscience track. So as uh, Teresa mentioned, together the three of us make up the second collective impact team, which is a unique initiative where three civic scholars are encouraged to work together and collaborate to make a difference. The grant enables scholars to pool their resources and access additional funding to address a common challenge and increase their reach, in our case, across the country. So this summer we were spread out across the nation, all three of us supporting the efforts of nonprofit organizations in our hometowns. I was in San Francisco, California, working with Compass Family Services. Callie worked with the Center for Violence Prevention in Pearl, Mississippi, and Mackenzie was in St. Louis working with Places for People. Um, initially, we wanted to focus on how disparities in the healthcare system impact women of various backgrounds across the U.S., as that is a topic we're all incredibly interested in. However, after the COVID-19 pandemic happened, we thought it was important to pivot our focus to people continuing to provide essential services during these times and working to highlight their experiences. After several meetings, we decided to focus on essential workers in the nonprofit sector space. Um, we came to this decision after realizing that all of us would be working at nonprofits in different regions that do very different work to support surrounding communities and realizing that their stories were important and were not being shared as often in the media. During our civic summer, we met every single week over Zoom to update each other on our summer experiences, filled each other in on stories from our internships, and worked on our collective impact project. While we were far apart geographically, we were very intentional about staying connected in order to support each other in comprehensive ways. Um, finally, as a result of our combined civic summers, we are in the process of launching our upcoming blog entitled Unknown Essentials, um, a platform through which we will share our interviews and findings from a collective impact project. The intention is, is that viewers would be able to read the transcripts of the interviews, as well as learn about and support the organizations our interviewees serve. So I spent my summer working in San Francisco's Tenderloin neighborhood at Compass Family Services. And this is an image of a wall-sized tree decal I put up at Compass while I was there. It features words of inspiration and encouragement as well as photos of the shelter's wonderful staff and clients. And I love this picture, not just because it took me three hours to put up, um, but I'll come back to it a little later. If you Google the Tenderloin neighborhood, you're bound to get results of images like this one. In a city with the most billionaires per capita and where the median income is in the six figures, the Tenderloins is just $23,000. It is in the heart of the city, just blocks away from the headquarters of Twitter, Uber, Square, as well as my high school. And it's also beginning to look more and more like this one, as companies just like the ones that I just mentioned uh, continue to buy more property and contribute to even higher cost of living than what it already is in San Francisco, which is of course exorbitant. But while the Tenderloin is the city's most diverse neighborhood and has a very rich history, unfortunately, this is the kind of national media attention that it gets. Articles like this are not only degrading of the neighborhood and its residents, 
It ignores the real issue at hand, the fact that the neighborhood is over-policed, under-resourced, and both systemically and systematically pushed aside by the city and its leadership and has been for decades. And so instead, I think this article headline is far more accurate. San Francisco has failed the neighborhood and its unhoused population. And I want to acknowledge that I use the word unhoused instead of homeless intentionally. They are unhoused people by the people who should be housing them and by inequitable housing policies, and it is not their entire identity. I was supposed to spend the summer working in Boston and working at a healthcare clinic for unhoused individuals. When the pandemic hit and I shifted gears, something strong compelled me to return home and support the unhoused community in San Francisco. After years of being frustrated by the lack of response from the city to support their neighbors, the Civic Scholars community gave me the opportunity to help do something about it. In the midst of COVID-19, San Francisco's housing crisis has significantly worsened. Social distancing is nearly impossible, testing is inaccessible, and the number of tents in the neighborhood has exploded by 285%. The city's response in return has been weak and inequitable. While I came into my summer hoping to make some sort of dramatic, high-level, tangible change on the community, I quickly realized that that wasn't what was needed. There's already so much excellent work being done to reduce homelessness and support the Tenderloin's residents. So what was really needed was more manpower, or in my case, more woman power. And so I spent my summer as an intern with Compass Family Services, which supports unhoused and at-risk families achieve stability through a number of different programs. I split my time working on site at their emergency 90 day family shelter, doing case management support and virtually supporting their development team doing grant research and writing. Working on site at the shelter throughout the pandemic was a formative experience for me. The team that I worked with was woefully understaffed, yet nonetheless did their jobs with unwavering passion and commitment unlike I had ever seen. They frequently got donations such as the one you see here, dozens of pizzas, but struggled to get, help their clients find housing and employment amidst the crisis. I quickly realized that my job was to support the staff that was underworked, sorry, overworked and underpaid, working 12 hours a day throughout the pandemic in order to help unhoused families as best as they could. I realized that if I was prov providing any sort of help, even if I was rearranging the kids' playroom you see here, then I was making a difference. I also got to work with some of those amazing kids, running programming for them a few days a week and assisting them assisting in getting them signed up for summer camps and enrolled in school. I was reminded of how much I love working with kids, despite the fact that they are brutally honest and free, frankly, quite exhausting, but they're still incre incredibly energizing and inspired me with all of their future potential. So while I came in with perhaps unrealistic expectations of changing the world in two months, I feel so lucky to have worked with the amazing team you see here. If I made their lives just a little bit easier every day, increasing their capacity so that they could keep working their hardest throughout these truly unprecedented times, then I think I was doing something right. In the end, my civic summer brought me closer to my home community of San Francisco, a community gathered here in June in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. While the city may have, may have many issues and I may never be able to afford to move back, it is still home and one that I'm committed to bettering. And so I come back to this image of this tree. While it might look like just a decoration, it represents so much more. It is an entire community of people dedicating to support, dedicated to supporting one another, to working together and to making lives better. And my job was just one tiny sliver, one branch of that greater tree. Thank you. Firstly, um, before I get started, I would like to give a trigger warning and offer some resources that are displayed on this slide. As my civic summer does focus on interpersonal violence, please feel free to take a step back, um, to take a break and do anything you need to take care of yourself. Your mental health takes priority and I just wanted to emphasize that before I get started. Um, so I spent my civic summer in my home state of Mississippi, which was an intentional decision as I wanted to give back and learn more about the community that has deeply contributed to who I am today and plays a large role in my civic journey. I wanted to use this picture to dis display our newly elected state flag, replacing the previous one that included a Confederate image. Um, interpersonal violence is the intentional use of power and force against a person or group. This is a very loose definition, but this encompasses domestic violence, sexual violence, human trafficking, and more. Nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. During one year, this equates to more than 10 million women and men. 
Mississippi is ranked one of the top 10 states with the highest rate of domestic violence. As said previously, I worked as a summer intern at the Center for Violence Prevention in the city of Pearl, which has several branches of work, including human trafficking, a domestic violence shelter, a second chance store, a crisis hotline, and more. Um, after shadowing and observing employees from all the different branches, I ultimately worked at the bridge, which offers forensic services um, in addition to case management and advocacy services for sexual assault survivors. However, much of the work is interactive between the different branches of work, so I did often find myself engaging with people outside the bridge as well. As an intern, one of the first things I did was to complete a 40-hour sexual assault advocacy training through the Office for Office for Victims of Crime. This was an essential step for me in order to meet with survivors and, pre and be present with them as they receive support services. After completing this training, I was able to tag along with my supervisors to, su um, to support survivors in hospital settings, court settings, and more. I went on several trips this past summer to pick up survivors from the hospital and bring them back to receive more specialized services and support. Um, survivors are offered transportation, clothes, food, um, case managed support, um, and more. The Center for Violence Prevention also offers court advocacy services for survivors, um, but this is not something I really um, experienced due to the COVID pandemic and court closing. However, one time I did have the opportunity to go with my supervisor to a court two hours away in order to provide support to a survivor who was to testify in front of a grand jury. Additionally, the Center for Violence Prevention offer, also offers support survivors who want to report their experience to the police. This was an interesting experience, especially given that so many Black Lives Matter protests were going on this past summer as well. Many domestic violence shelters often must maintain a working relationship with police departments in order to support survivors. However, oftentimes police are not well trained in supporting survivors comprehensively and sometimes prioritize covering up a case to keep crime statistics low. This made me rethink the role of police specifically in relation to interpersonal violence. For example, one survivor I met this summer was completely invalidated by a police officer because of her drug history. Additionally, the role of intersectionality is essential to understanding the lack of care for survivors. For example, people with disabilities are statistically more likely to experience interpersonal violence, but many shelters and services are not designed to support their disability statuses, resulting in a huge gap in support, including from the police, especially when survivors are unable to articulate their experiences like able-bodied people do. A personal project I worked on was creating a sexual violence training for college campuses in central Mississippi. This included various topics such as the prevalence of sexual violence for college students, tools for sur supporting survivors, what is trauma-informed care, what are the different types of sexual violence, and examples and red flags of each and more. I also tried to include information about the Title IX process and resources for each college. However, because of Betsy DeVos's new Title IX regulations, many college campuses were in a transition period and did not have much information to offer. So while I did not learn as much about the, the specific Title IX policies, I did learn about the role of the Department of Education in Title IX. A personal goal of mine was to learn more about Mississippi's history and to explore the state even more. I safely traveled to different parts of the state, including the Mississippi Delta, a ghost town, and the place in this picture. This was where the bodies of three freedom summer activists were found in Neshoba County, Mississippi. This is an example of the deep, dark, and bitter history that is a part of Mississippi. Um, but this is a picture I took at my best friend's house um, and farm in Sebastopol. My civic summer has shown me that Mississippi is more than its darkness and pain, and this picture kind of reminds me of that. There's so much beauty, love, and power there, and I'm so grateful I got to witness and be part of that every day this past summer. Thank you. Uh, for my civic summer, I knew I wanted to focus on the health disparities in St. Louis that inform deep-seated issues within our region. As a St. Louis native, I've only scratched the surface of my understanding of these critical issues. I believe it's important to further analyze the social determinants of health that play such a huge role in the lives of many marginalized people, as well as their access to quality healthcare services. In particular, I've always been interested in the stigma that pertains to mental health disorders in the Black community. I knew I wanted to work with an organization that focuses on increasing accessibility to psychiatric resources and other related social services, because the intersection of mental health with physical health is so important for overall well being, yet it is often overlooked in our society. Then, when COVID-19 happened and ultimately changed the trajectory of everyone's lives, I believed it was important to analyze how these unparalleled moments were impacting vulnerable communities. In particular, I wondered how people with intersecting marginalized identities were coping with these additional stressors and what was being done to increase and provide necessary services during these times. 
As you may know, COVID-19 disproportionately affects marginalized groups in regard to number of cases and deaths, employment, health, and safety, and additional unpaid responsibilities, such as having to take care of children, other family members, and household tasks. Thus, it is important to be aware of the intersection of these identities as it pertains to these issues, and I want to understand how these problems are being mitigated. So this summer, I virtually interned at Place for People, a nonprofit in St. Louis that centers those in the community battling mental health and substance use disorders by providing them with comprehensive healthcare resources and social services. The people in which they serve spans all backgrounds and their goal is to is support all who need it and to uplift their voices. This is an overview of the many services that Place for People provides and they tailor their support based on the individual and what approach is adaptable to their lives. They understand that healing is not linear and at any time the services people need could change. So I worked with the project director for grants, which is an extension of the development team and is one segment of the multifaceted organization. So before I started working, I met with my supervisor many times to talk about my goals for the summer. I also participated in a three day long training with practicum students, specialists, therapists, and many others to learn more about the mission of the organization and to better understand how I was able to focus on different populations with varying needs through a combination of outpatient services, research, and rehab. So then I spent my time compiling lists of virtual healthcare fairs and resources that clients could use during quarantine as a means to learn more about the pandemic and testing services, to join virtual support groups, or to learn more about various healthcare topics. Additionally, I created a list of concepts and definitions that pertain to diversity, equity, and inclusion to use in the grant writing process. However, I ultimately spent most of my summer focusing on the goals of our collective impact by interviewing 10 employees at Place for People via Zoom about their experiences continuing to provide essential services during these unprecedented times. As I soon learned, their experiences vary greatly, but they all focused on centering their clients as best they could given the circumstances. Um, one quote I wanted to share from one of my interviews was, when COVID first started, our team wanted to take a lead on what we could do for our clients during this scary time. I found that these words informed a common theme from everyone I spoke to because they wanted to be a support system for the many people that were understandably fearful of the future and were unsure of how to handle some of the challenges that they were facing in these present moments. So employees decided to do work completely remote while others provided in-person services as needed. However, they all expressed how building and maintaining rapport was at the center of the work they were doing. Although they had to set important boundaries related to health and safety because of the pandemic, they focused on creating trustworthy relationships by meeting clients where they were. Additionally, I wanted to discuss an interview I did with one person from the Henry Street Settlement in New York. We talked a lot about adaptability as he usually does music lessons in the community for the organization. Then when the pandemic happened, he had to shift his focus to helping distribute groceries to families in the area. He just wanted to do anything he could to help make people's lives a little bit easier. Um, at the beginning of the summer, I wondered what exactly impact would look like under these very unusual circumstances and given the constraints. I realized that the concept of, concept of impact is so complex and it can be informed by many different experiences, such as a global pandemic. Thus, I left the summer realizing that making an impact can just simply mean being there for people when they just need it the most. So as I participate in other forms of engagement throughout the summer, like virtually working with 100 great high school students through the college prep program, shadowing a patient-centered geriatric psychiatrist, and working with a clinical researcher who continuously checks in on the community members she works with, I was able to witness multiple instances of how uplifting others can make huge differences during these really difficult times. In the end, I learned more about St. Louis than I could have ever imagined. What makes community special and what makes St. Louis special are the many wonderful people doing this important work and the people that have chosen to center others when they need it most. This is a message that I carry with me now and I will continue to carry with me throughout the rest of my life. Thank you so much for listening. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ahmed Hanafi. Uh, I'm a senior studying neuroscience with a minor in computer science. So I'm sure many of us have been in this exact situation. We get in our car, we drive over to a doctor, we're basically perfectly on time for our doctor's appointment. And then we end up just sitting and waiting for a really, really long time. And we just stare at fish and fill out forms. Um, the average Time spent waiting was about 18 minutes and 13 seconds. And then after all of that, we end up in the examination room and we expect to see a physician, but we only interact with physicians for about 10 minutes before they leave. And we're basically in that room alone again. So that begs the question, which is what is the physician doing during that time? And the answer is actually pretty simple. Physicians spend a lot of their time on the computer. 
uh, whether it's putting in orders or whether it's literally just transcribing patient information um, and lab data into the existing electronic health record system. So this is really frustrating for, pay, for physicians because they actually end up spending about 16 minutes per patient on the computer, uh, which is more than time than they spend with a patient. So me as well as three other students decided to try to attack this problem for the WashU student run health clinic. Uh, they had this exact same issue and we decided to develop something called an optical character recognition software, which I'll talk a little bit more about later uh, to kind of resolve this problem. And basically the whole main idea behind it is to attack it using the intersection between healthcare uh, and technology. So when you, people mention the intersection between healthcare and technology, it's a huge mess. It, like this is what people picture and that's absolutely right. It's exactly what it is. So we decided to focus on just one small vein, which is just the lab data uh, and making it so that they don't have to literally transcribe information. So the main goals of our project were number one, to reduce the amount of time that physicians spent on a computer and increase it so they were spending more time with patients. And number two was to give the clinic the tools to model patient data to better understand the population that they're working with and better care for their community. So again, we did this using an OCR. So an optical character recognition software basically takes images with text. This can either be typed or handwritten and it takes a scanned photo, it goes through the program and it comes out the other end as text the computer can process or parse. Uh, the goal is to then take that text and implement it right into the electronic health record service and then also keep that as a copy. Now, if you look up OCR, you'll see there's a bunch of free online OCRs. So why don't we use one that already exists? And the answer is you can't just upload patient health information into a random website online. Obviously that's in violation of HIPAA and it's incredibly unethical. Number two, it does not incorporate with the EHR. So you're actually not saving any time. You just now have a, a text file um, with that information. So in order to understand how to do this, we had to do a lot of reading. We read something called Two Scoops of Django, which teaches us how to do like a web framework uh, using Python, as well as GitHub, which is an uh, open source framework for people to just share and collaborate on code and better understand. So after doing our research, we basically found that there were two main caveats of like two main programs that we could use. We could either use Tesser OCR or something called PyTesseract. Um, we didn't know which one was gonna end up being better. So we just split the team in half. Half us worked on Tesser OCR, half us worked on PyTesseract and whichever was more successful we were gonna go with. I actually ended up working with Tesser OCR and then coincidentally it also happened to be the one that we ended up going with. Obviously like any project, there are a bunch of road bumps and one of them was uh, using a Windows computer. So I was using a Windows computer as well as another person on my team and there were just so many compatibility issues. It, we just could not make any progress for the first couple of weeks because just there was just lack of documentation about how to resolve those issues. But we ended up switching to a Mac and somehow it fixed all the problems. Another issue that we had was trying to do the handwriting portion of the OCR. Obviously, there's so many different varieties of handwriting that we just didn't have access to. Uh, we were only four people, so we can't just come up with a bunch of different samples. Also, it's very difficult to uh, code it because another problem that we face is that we don't really know how to do anything with machine learning. So machine learning was basically a way to train the, the algorithm to understanding different kinds of handwriting. So we just didn't have that experience and it's, it's incredibly complex. So we decided to kind of ditch that caveat and kind of focus on just focus on like the type text because we felt that would be much more effective uh, and result in a more like robust program. Uh, we actually ended up having a 100% success rate in our type documents. Every single document that we sent through our OCR was able to be successfully converted into text and put into the EHR. So as far as we were concerned, we had a deployable product that actually ended up working really well and improved um, the efficiency of the clinic because they just take a photo and upload it and they're done. So moving forward, what does that look like? Uh, number one thing is to improve and add the machine learning aspect so we can actually analyze handwritten documents as well. That will make the program much, much more complete and have an even larger impact on the clinic. Also, because this is open source code, it can be plugged into other student run health clinics uh, around the nation um, and could also be implemented there. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Max Claypo. Uh, I am a psychology neuroscience philosophy major uh, at WashU. Um, yeah, uh, we can go ahead and get, get started. Um, so I'm sure many of you have heard statistics about prisons in America. Um, the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the entire world. We imprison millions of people every single day, um, thousands of children. And we actually spend more than $100 billion between state and federal funds all on incarceration. 
Um, and we're actually terrible at equipping people with the tools and skills necessary to flourish upon exiting corrections. Um, one study tracked uh, justice involved people over the course of about 10 years, found that 83% of them uh, became reinvolved at some time with the correctional system. And we know that there are massive systemic barriers uh, to success upon leaving corrections. And over the course of my year as a civic scholar, I learned how many phenomenal organizations, both locally and nationally, um, are working on a number of these barriers. But one area that is severely understudied and not particularly well understood uh, are the psychological effects of incarceration and how they can be mitigated in the system. What we do know is that being involved with the criminal justice system in America is inherently traumatizing. You can see this quote from the Urban Institute that summarizes some of the basics. But what I wanted to learn was how we can use psychological programming to not only ease that burden, but also equip justice involved people with the psychological tools necessary to promote resilience and improve mental health in the face of what they've suffered at the hands of the American correctional system. So my research this summer investigated how we can do that by bringing positive psychology, which is the study of well-being, resilience, um, into the American correctional system. And that includes things like teaching concepts and skills that build on the positive aspects of a person's life and actually help use that as a buffer for difficult experiences and a booster for positive ones. And a couple of examples of that are things like um, identifying and learning to use character strengths to improve self-esteem and make difficult tasks more tolerable, practicing coping mechanisms that build resilience, such as positive reframing, and learning about practices that can improve mental health in the short term, such as savoring, gratitude, and mindfulness. When we put these things together, you get something called a positive intervention program, or a PIP. Um, and PIPs have been shown to be a low cost, scalable approach to improving the resilience and the mental health of people in pretty much any other area we can think of. So they do it in schools, we do it in private organizations, even in sports. And so to get into this, I did what I think every good undergraduate knows how to do. And I started a literature review. I made a spreadsheet, I downloaded a citation manager. I was very excited uh, to dive into some uh, articles. And after searching for meta-analyses of these programs or opinion pieces about them, I found pretty much nothing. Um, basically no information about it in corrections. And so I was frustrated and I was a little panicky um, and I had to pivot. What I learned is that justice involved people are a population that are often ignored by academia and especially by the field of psychology. Um, programs were implemented in populations that could afford it. And so I had to send out dozens of cold emails in, to criminologists and psychologists until I found a collaborator at the Arizona State University Center for Correctional Solutions. The CCS partners with justice involved communities um, using something called a participatory action research approach, which is collaborative and it works to understand the needs of a population rather than the standard scientific approach of observing and then manipulating. Their research has been groundbreaking and they've developed programs uh, throughout their state. And so along with Dr. Wright, um, Kevin Wright and Stephanie Morse, I propose that we co-author research that actually brings together corrections and positive psychology to propose an entirely new field of study called positive corrections. And our goal is to make the argument that these are cost-effective, easy ways to give back to a community that has suffered at the hands of the American people. But when thinking about my actual summer, um, it's pretty difficult. And I think that's true for our, my entire cohort. Our plans changed suddenly and we had to pivot um, because partner organizations were overwhelmed. In my case, correctional facilities no longer allowed visitors or volunteers. And so I had to reimagine how I can serve a community that I could no longer physically connect with. And so I had to turn to that academic research as an outlet to advocate for improvements both in policy and in practice. And what I learned is that research can be exhausting and annoying and tedious and it can feel elitist, but it's essential for securing funding, for bringing stakeholders together and for making sure that the practices that we advocate for as organizers and activists are effective. I think most importantly though this summer, it only improved my understanding of a system that I now know is designed to traumatize and to dehumanize and to entrap people. Sheltering in place while conducting this research um, also affirmed for me just how dangerous it can be for allies and people with greater privilege to ignore injustice. And I think overall I learned that change is never as fast as we want it to be or it needs to be. And it sometimes requires stepping back to reevaluate and making choices about where our efforts and research and energy should be focused. But this program has helped me learn to listen and conserve my energy and continue fighting for the idea that all people, regardless of who they are, um, deserve the right to pursue their own happiness. Um, and I'm really grateful for those who made it possible.
Hi, uh, my name is Logan Phillips. I'm majoring in African and African American studies and sociology, and my pronouns are she, hers. What comes to mind when you see this image? The first thing I think of is summertime. Popsicles, ice cream, excitement, and a break from school. Just like clockwork. School's out, heat a-blazing, kids out, guns a-blazing. The names, the hashtags become innumerable. Summertime is not always sunshine and vacations. It's a wound that never heals. It's blackness with a capital B, dehumanized every summer. Yet it is expected that children return to the classroom bells, leaving their experiences at the door. These same bells that alert America every summer of her permission to increase state sanctioned violence against black people. My civic summer experience was grounded in a critical examination of my experiences with education around the desire to highlight the absence and lack of instruction of black history within the American history education curriculum and its impact on the wellness of black children in K through 12. The chaotic and unpredictable nature of the pandemic in combination with Teresa's encouragement to the, the class forced me to consider the possibility and potential of my creativity. With that, Black Girl Edgevis came to be. It is an educational advocacy blog that embodies the goal of my civic summer. It is important to note that we can't criticize education in the curriculum without talking about residential segregation, redlining, zoning, and restrictive covenants. These practices were a part of the deliberate and strategic implementation of racist housing policies to advance segregation. And they also function as social determinants of education. Brown declared that segregated schools were inherently unequal. An overlooked downside was the unfortunate impact on black educators. The law did not protect the jobs of black teachers and administrators. And as a result, school desegregation often fo forced the dismissal of many black educators who were previously teaching in all black schools. 51 years later in 2005, about 7,500 teachers were fired after Hurricane Katrina. Nearly 4,000 out of that 7,500 were black women, 53%. The largest firing of black women in history and what I would argue to be a contemporary replay of the displacement of black educators after Brown. Schooling. It's this mechanical monotonous process that many are familiar with. Going to class, completing assignments, regurgitating information. This banking model is upheld because ed the education system structures school to be nothing short of an industrial marketplace. Information is deposited as if students' minds are banks, but their lived experiences also provide them with a significant level of expertise that educators must be cognizant of. Educators have just as much of a responsibility to learn from students as students learn from them. I'm certain that I'm not the first to be aware of this gap in the educational sphere. So I look beyond to learn more. First, by attending a conference hosted by the Carter Center, whose work leverages history educators, social studies teachers, community educators, policymakers, and other advocates to transform Black history education within schools. Additionally, interning with the National Black Child Development Institute also introduced me to policy and advocacy at the national level. NBCDI focuses on culture, culturally relevant resources, literacy, family engagement, wellness, and quality early childhood education advocacy. My Civic Summer allowed me to build networks of people and organizations committed to Black history education and a more humanizing pursuit of education for Black children overall. Amidst the pandemic, I expanded my understanding of community partners. They exist locally as well as nationally. Just like education, Community is not simply bound by location. It is bound by a collective commitment to work towards a more liberating future and recognizing that the work may go beyond our lifetime. So what is education to me? It is a site of liberation, the ability to live and exist freely and wholeheartedly as oneself, thrive rather than survive, where black children and all children of the global majority can see themselves within the curriculum and have the freedom to examine the world. It is community. It transgresses the physical walls of a school building and frankly prospers in spite of it. Education is a continual process of unlearning and learning to disrupt systems that perpetuate oppression within our youth's learning environment. Just as food nourishes the body for survival, education, knowledge of oneself and how they exist in the world with others nourishes the mind and soul. 
It exemplifies the humanity of education as a practice of freedom. It is the cultivation of one's humanity and identity. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andrew Whitaker. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm majoring in biomedical engineering and I am from Cincinnati, Ohio. So my project is about when COVID-19 meets asthma. So um, the first thing I would love to talk about is the emphasis of how like COVID-19 um, means to me. So. What I'll, I'm gonna first like show what I'm gonna you'll see throughout my presentation. So you'll well, we're gonna identify the problem. We're gonna I'm gonna talk to you about my motivation, um, my partnership. We're gonna get into the details of my project, and then we will start with the results and like the future about what I've learned through my project. So the big problem right now is the gigantic disparity in asthma ER visits. In St. Louis, asthma is the number one reason why kids go to the hospital. Um, black kids are 10 times more likely than white kids to go to the hospital. And there are so many reasons for this. And it starts with indoor and outdoor pollution. So indoor and outdoor pollution, such as mold, pests, dust, smoke, chemicals, pollen, and access to medicine are all reasons why from one district to the next, a neighboring district, a kid might be 10 to five times more likely to have asthma. And St. Louis asthma is such a big deal that um, one in five kids have asthma in St. Louis. So I decided to partner with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. They are already involved in the issue and have access to connect with schools and connect with people to give them health care or help them with the affordability of health care. Um, so my, my first part, part of my project was navigating the nonprofit. I really focused on the asthma portion before COVID-19 came about. So that meant connecting with clients, getting them applied to the Asthma Analogy Foundation, navigating how grants work, navigating how to get more money when they've missed some of their fundraisers because of COVID. And then, so when COVID-19 is asthma, COVID is obviously a very intense respiratory issue. And asthma is also a very intense respiratory issue. It has inflamed, inflamed blood, I mean, inflamed your lungs, so it's hard to breathe. So when these two meet each other, it can be a really scary issue. So what I proposed was to send supplies to Missouri schools um, across, uh, across the districts. And these are some of the supplies. So you have spacers, you have asthma and COVID education, you have um, some sponsoring and bagging, and you have disposable chambers for asthma. So one of the big parts of this is to help set up the website. So the schools will order these asthma supplies from a website and at the AAFA organization will actually send them this stuff for free. We, we got grants for it and it was my job to rearrange the website for the schools to order. So I set up the in project and I had a lot of volunteers. I actually had a lot of our, our fellow civics come um, and help me out and some of my athlete friends. We were in Whitaker Hall. I had to find a location. I had to order all the supplies. I had to get boxes. Um, I had to have PPE to make sure everybody was safe. And we were just building all these boxes to send supplies to all these schools in Missouri. So it was the day was a huge success. We had over 400 COVID asthma kits ready to ship across Missouri, which is fantastic. But I still think some things could have been improved. So one of these things that could have been improved was the like the flow of the build. So like more boxes could have been built a little bit faster and having shipping labels ready because the shipping of the of the kits to um, schools could have been a lot more efficient and making sure the boxes were built more sturdy and having more supplies so we could get more things done. But overall, I had a ton of fun throughout my summer and it was really something that was very tangible and I get a lot of growth. So what I learned through being in a nonprofit is how much a team matters and how many different hats everybody wears like everybody kind of just does everything a lot of times you're not stuck to your own um categories so what's next for us so right now the asthma and allergy foundation actually have a 80s themed trivia night this 
um, Saturday night. And it's a huge fundraiser if you'd love to go um, to help raise money for the foundation, help raise money for kids with asthma. And that's it. That's all I have for you. Um, I want to thank you for your time. And um, my project was a ton of fun. Hi, uh, my name is Lorenzo Salon. Um, I use he, him pronouns. I'm a biology major and a sociology minor here at WashU, and I am originally from Philadelphia. By now, we should all be aware of the mental health epidemic that faces college students across the country. 39% of students in college experience a significant mental health issue. 67% of young adults with depression or anxiety do not receive treatment. And in recent years, the percentage of college students that visited counselors increased from 30% to 40%. So what are colleges doing about this mental health epidemic? Common sense would say to add more counselors and mental health professionals in order to account for these trends. However, it has become abundantly clear that the demand for counselors is drastically outpacing the supply as many counselors and psychiatrists have lengthy wait times and are overbooked. Let's take WashU for example, which has made the conscious effort to bolster their mental health services. We now have a total of 16 mental health professionals who are wonderful, but if the national statistics hold true, then over 3000 individuals would need help from 16 people. And this is obviously an overgeneralization, but I hope the, paint, the picture I'm trying to paint is clear. One intervention that has seen an increase in usage is the peer counseling organization on campus, Uncle Joe's. Over the past 10 years, we have seen a 400% increase in call volume. I have been a part of this organization since my first year in college and can say without a doubt that it has altered the course of my college career and my like, life aspirations in general. Let it be clear, we are not trained professionals, we do not give advice and we cannot make medical diagnoses. Even so, there is clear research that shows how the ability to talk about the problems you are dealing with is incredibly helpful for your overall well-being and mental health. Even if it may not solve the problem, it is an integral part of the healing process. I also wanted to make it clear that Uncle Joe's is not the perfect organization. We have many problems that other student organizations face, such as member retainment and engagement, filling all the duty slots, finding the best way to advertise, diversity and representation, and at times like conflicts between our own members. And we're still working on these problems to this day. For my civic summer, I worked to establish a network that would connect collegiate peer counseling organizations across the country. The three main goals of this network were to strengthen existing peer counseling organizations by serving as a hub for open dialogue, investing in new peer counseling groups, and finally advocating for better mental health services overall on college campuses. I worked closely with a steering committee with student representatives of groups from Stanford, Tufts, and UC Berkeley. I vividly remember my first Zoom call with the co-director of The Bridge from Stanford as we babbled on for a few hours about our experiences in our own respective groups, which cemented my belief that this network could have a positive impact going forward. Since this was an entirely self-directed project, it was definitely a new and informative experience as I had to step into a leadership role, which I was a little apprehensive and nervous about. While interacting with this group of talented and caring individuals, I finally realized my main focus was to listen to their ideas and make them a reality. Throughout the summer, um, I was able to create a Slack channel with about 15 existing peer counseling organizations and five new groups that were just starting up. And the number continues to increase to this day. I learned from my initial intake calls with each group that the Zoom calls where we would freely discuss topics were the most beneficial in terms of learning from each other. We had multiple Zoom calls where nine, like roughly nine to 10 representatives from each peer counseling groups would gather once, once or twice a month. And we would discuss topics such as advertising to the student body um, and also topics re revolving around COVID and how we are going to prepare for the semester coming up. As you may have noticed, the vast majority of schools that had peer counseling programs were private elite institutions. This was something that we talked about as a group but unfortunately we were unable to take concrete actions upon. I hope that going forward, we are able to include students from other types of institutions and help spread the peer counseling model to more schools across the nation. One of the most rewarding parts of my summer occurred when talking to students from new peer counseling groups. Their main concerns mostly stemmed from convincing their administration and legal teams that their model was viable and safe. From the meetings that I was able to facilitate with them, they informed me that the discussions we had provided crucial information to help convince the administrators and legal teams. 
Recently, my project interests have taken a few unexpected turns. I've had the opportunity to work on a podcast that focuses on providing college students with the tools to better understand their mental health. From my network, I plan to bring in students and faculty from other institutions to contribute to this project with the ultimate goal of making this information accessible to all students. Overall, I know that peer counseling is not the final answer to the mental health epidemic. I hope that my summer would be able to provide support and community to a widespread group of individuals doing some incredible work. I dream that in the years to come that this network will continue to thrive and support peer counselors in their efforts to better themselves and the community of people around them. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo, and thank you to all of our scholars um, for your presentations tonight. I think one of the things that really solidified for me uh, during your presentation, our scholars are so humble. There's so much that they shared tonight that I hadn't even heard yet. Um, so it's been really exciting to hear um, all that they've done and all that they've contributed to the communities and partners that they worked with. Um, so I wanna thank each and every one of our scholars and I wanna uh, thank each and every one of you who have attended tonight as supporters um, for our scholars, because as we say, you know, it's not done without community and you all are, are a part of their communities of supporters um, in so many ways. So thank you so much for attending tonight. Genesis will drop in one more time. Um, the bio sheets for our students, which also include their email addresses. I hope that you, again, recognize this as a conversation starter and hopefully you've heard some ideas that were inspiring that you would also want to move forward with or just want to share words of encouragement and support to our students. Please do that. Please reach out to them and know that this is just the beginning for so many of them and we look forward to seeing what they do in the very near future. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and have a great evening.